On the 23rd of June 2016, the issue that many people in this island felt was resolved was forced back into the forefront of our minds. The Brexit vote brought old fears back into the news agenda. Sectarian issues and politics of the North are suddenly, again, central to the politics, both here in Dublin and in London. Symbols here in the North are often more important than reality. But what is it that underpins the politics of the North? What needs to be understood about the North's history to understand today? If you had to pick a day to begin the modern history of Northern Ireland, you could do worse than pick the 20th of June, 1968. Now, you could start on the day the Normans landed in Ireland 800 years ago, or the plantation of Ulster 400 years later. But on that day in 1968, the issues brewing in the North, well, for centuries, began coming to a head. A Catholic rights activist, Austin Curry, and his supporters were holding a sit-in in Tyrone. They were dragged out by officers from the overwhelmingly Protestant police force. It was like a shot of adrenaline for the recently formed Northern Ireland Civil Rights Association. That group was led by Catholics who wanted the authorities to stop discriminating against them over their religion. Well, first of all, as a nationalist, I, I'm in favour of reunification. Also, of course, uh, there's the question of discrimination. I must make sure that I hammer that uh, particular thing on every occasion that it rears its head. Their campaign ballooned from there. They set about marching all across Northern Ireland. Over the next six months, there were increasing numbers of clashes between the marchers and Protestant groups. At Dungiven, they at last refused to accept police rerouting and broke a cordon to head for Claudia. Tension grew. Rival Protestant and Catholic groups were fighting. Then in January 1969, loyalists attacked a march at Bertollet Bridge. Four times the students were ambushed on that last 10 miles to Derry. A terrible battle at Burntollet Bridge. Some of the marchers concluded that the police had led them in intentionally and then showed little interest in protecting them. And that was it. Rioting broke out across the north. By August, the government in London had deployed the British Army to restore order. They were initially welcomed by the nationalists. Now, it's important to remember that the IRA had been inactive for a decade at this point. But into the late 60s and early 70s, as clashes continued, demands grew from Catholics who wanted protection from attacks. Political inertia from those in power in Northern Ireland, of course, created a vacuum, which the men and women of violence were only too happy to exploit. The IRA would emerge again in a new form in 1969 after a split in both the armed and political wings of republicanism over ideological and political issues, the provisional IRA and the modern version of Sinn Féin emerged. In the early 70s, it capitalised on the growing distrust for the security forces among Catholics and the growing division in the North over the response to the civil rights marches. Any trust Catholics had left in the security forces and British Army was destroyed in 1972. British soldiers killed 14 unarmed civilians during a civil rights march in Derry. <laughs> the families of victims had to wait until 2010, but eventually the British government admitted the killings were unjustified and unjustifiable. Some members of our armed forces acted wrongly, and for that, on behalf of the government, indeed on behalf of our country, I am deeply sorry. These were the most violent years of the Troubles. Up to 20 gunmen surrounded the minibus. Some of the attacks that still echo into today's news stories were carried out in these years. The Kingsmill Massacre. Its Catholic driver taken to safety. The Protestants on board mown down mercilessly. The Miami show band attack. At the graveside, the French father broke down. The Dublin Monaghan bombings. I had the holy eyes with me and I ministered to them as many as I could and uh, well between dead and seriously injured I would imagine that there was almost uh, 20 or 22. But by the late 1970s the level of violence had dropped dramatically. However the wounds remained wide open. By then the IRA saw itself as the de facto protection force for the Catholic community. Huge numbers of Catholics opposed their tactics. 
they regularly killed civilians. But by the late 70s, they began the slow, too slow, many would say, process of slowly moving from a staunchly paramilitary organisation to a political one. The seeds of the issues that emerged in the early 80s were growing in this. To some extent, the Republicans wanted it both ways. Sinn Féin wanted to be viewed as a legitimate political party while maintaining the closest of alliances with a group determined to achieve its objectives by paramilitary force. The British authorities were determined to treat the members of that force whom it managed to capture as simply criminals, while the IRA insisted that those who had been captured should be treated as political prisoners. Eventually, in 1981, the prisoners began a hunger strike. The British Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, opposed making any concessions to them, and 10 IRA men died. It dominated the news headlines for months. In 1984, the IRA hit back, attempting to assassinate Margaret Thatcher at her party conference in Brighton. Mrs Thatcher survived, but five others were killed. An inhuman, undiscriminating attempt to massacre innocent, unsuspecting men and women. The attacks continued over the following years. Mortar attacks on IEC bases, the horror of Enniskillen. But by the early 90s, a nascent political process was taking off. Talks between the moderate nationalist leader John Hume and Sinn Féin leader Gerry Adams paved the way for the Downing Street Declaration in December 1993. By 1994, the announcement of an IRA ceasefire was met with wild celebrations across the north. For the first time in many years, it seems the people of Northern Ireland can dare to hope that a future without violence might just be possible. But the celebrations were premature. The ceasefire collapsed in 1996. Despite that, tortuous political negotiations continued. Eventually, in 1998, the Good Friday Agreement was signed by the British and Irish governments, Sinn Féin and most of the political parties in the North. After a 30-year winter of sectarian violence, Northern Ireland today has the promise of a springtime of peace. It put in place a strange system of coalition government, whereby the leading parties on either side were forced to share power and the equality of both communities was recognised. Now, to some extent, unionists felt that they lost out in all of this. As far as unionists were concerned, they were the majority, and democracy meant that majority rule. But not anymore. The DUP didn't support the Good Friday deal, and the DUP dominates unionist politics now. More importantly, their votes in Westminster are keeping the Conservative government in London in place. What price for DUP support? But agreement did lead to the British government dismantling the massive network of security installations along the border. With both the North and the South in the European Union, there weren't any customs duties or trade tariffs to worry about. The border became invisible. And since then, there has been, broadly speaking, peace and then Brexit. The UK leaving the EU means the prospect of the border looms large once again. For some, it's evidence that proves what they believed all along, the British can't be trusted with the future of Northern Ireland. They say the EU now offers more to Northern Ireland than the UK, and it means now is the time to push for a united Ireland. For others, it's a chance to secure the future of Northern Ireland as part of the UK and a chance to force an end to the growing influence of the EU and by implication the Republic in the North. For many others, it's an unwanted return to a time when the future was simply constantly uncertain.